Philip Jones, who's a professor here at Philip Cobb, uh, works on issues of animal cognition, human cognition, the boundary. Um, and he'll be talking about interactive threefold models of chimpanzee social cognition. Thanks, Preston. So, Bianca just after lunch asked me that I should make a joke at the beginning to prevent me from sleeping. So, <laughs> here is the joke. If you Google Michael Tomasero, you will the images that the machine gives you. And in my presentation, I am going to criticize all the data and not this one. <laughs> So what is the outline? Like, there are several layers in my presentation. I hope that it will make some sense at the end. So my first part is basically about the construction of the muscle shirt in the As you will see, it will main, mainly center around joint attention. Like, he says that even in this step, there is a difference between humans and chimpanzees and other animals. In the in second part, I will try to show that generally trialing interactions, joint attention is just one case of it, has species specific character and what's quite important to say that there is always some experiential component and this experiential component might quite differ like, uh, from one species to another. And at the final part, like Glenda talked about radical anarchivism, um, I have different background, it's called biosemiotics, and I will try to introduce a model which will tackle with some of the problems about chimpanzee versus human social cognition and so on. So, yeah, probably. Basically, all of you are somehow acquainted to the muscles shared intentionally hypothesis. So, I will just repeat some of the parts which are crucial for the issue. So, he said that chimpanzees can work together, but they can truly cooperate. They independently pursue the reward and respond to the result of the partner's action. They like the concept of Venus and the difference which makes this human world of socialization unique is also cognitive and motivation. Like in this phenomenal of sharing intentions, uh, chimpanzees do not have a motivation which is connected to cooperativeness and so on. So, Basically, if I make like very, uh, I would say, on, uh, ontological uh, claim about what is what is Thomas Fellows work about. So it's about finding anthropological difference, and he says that it's grounded in the evolution of attention. Now. As a background of critique, I will use the work of Kim Barth. She is a developmental psychologist. Uh, in her laboratory, there is also one big name, David Evans, and I'm now trying to make uh, cooperation with them. And in the same year as this shared intentionality model, they published with experience of learning. Some philosophical background behind is uh, rather than uh, rather than an activism, I would say it's generally this interactive term. Mm -hmm. But uh, for me, what is the most important part is are some claims uh, which are uh, joined with uh, their empirical results. So, but first claim is about some philosophy behind. They claim that it is always difficult to determine the motivations either of human babies and chimpanzees. The behavior of chimpanzee adults is dependent on their individual life histories. This is one of the most important issues of their model. 
And they say that joint attention and cooperation are distinct entities. And we can, I will show later, how developmental trajectories in both of these abilities and in human and chimpanzee is different. Uh, there are also some claims which are quite similar to Thomas Hill, for example, that women babies are more skilled in joint attention than chimpanzees. But this is important, more skilled. They don't say there is any anthropological difference or big gap. So their ontological claim is quite different at the end. There is evolutionary continuity in developmental processes that subserve social cognition as such weakness. So now there will be three steps because so there is the additional level. I'm fascinated by the number of the studies on the topic and the results are really inconsistent <laughs> and uh, I would be very skeptical to say that there is uh, progress in, in the research like I really don't know if maybe some researchers who published 30 years ago have better view on what's going on than some contemporary issues like for me as a with some background in philosophy and history of science I am not committed to this process. So, first, what really struck me, if you read the literature, there are varying evidences. Like, there is basically between Thomas Hill and Bart and Lee, Lee on the other side, there is no common ground uh, with issues like pointing, which in fact is how you do So, this is, this is the first level which we are going to discuss now, varying evidences in literature. So, can I both... Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Yeah. Is it altruistic pointing? Because only Thomas Hill observes well, that they can be taught to point, but they do yeah, not yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We will, yeah, yeah, yeah. We will go to it. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, there, is, there is development in the discussion. So, I picked up just a few points. So, in... Uh, 2007, they claim that chimpanzees do not point, that they basically do not have this ability, like any point in the world. Uh, Carpenter, Cal, I, mean, I think they were in the same laboratory. Yeah. So, in 2013, they, they admitted that some chimpanzees do point, but only in Paris. So, no, no, not, not cooperation or uh, cooperative communication, no cooperative communication at all. In um, big opposition to these claims, Levens and his group say that enculturated apes, without a single exception, demonstrate pointing behavior. Enculturated apes are not only these famous cases like Vicky and Pasho and so on, which are raised in human families, but basically, uh, also laboratory chimpanzees, which went through something which we can call responsive care, which means that there is a lot of interaction not only among uh, chimpanzees themselves, but with also with human caregivers. This is quite important. Alexei Kurovsky, Estonian uh, zoologist keeper and also mathematician, he told me that uh, basically what is natural to and the natural, well, I don't want to go to details, with skeptic chimpanzees is that they are making like, uh, they make other chimpanzees alert what's going on, but they don't use hands, but they use lips. Something like this, like showing people the right direction. So, now the second level. Uh, let's say that uh, we have some intuition that uh, in situations like this, uh, So, oh. 
okay. Let, let, let's say that uh, there is a situation with, which seems to be similar, like in case of humans and chimpanzees or gorillas or whatever. For example, triadic game, that there are two intellectuals, the object, they seem to share attention, there is a lot of interaction among them. So the situation seems to be the same, but now what differs in literature is uh, how to interpret the situation. Maybe in fact it's something like this. So now it will be on the level of definitions and models. Uh, I think the most traditional definition of joint attention is this one, Bateman, Adamson. Uh, Triadic interaction in which two individuals coordinate their attention to an object of mutual interest. Now, we have discussed this with Latso some time ago. I think Atos example of two footballers contesting a ball basically falls under this definition. But of course, for Tomasello, this is not the case of joint attention. He says that uh, joint attention requires a shared goal, which is, which is not here because there is a contest. And I was always a bit skeptic at this point now, like how to really empirically distinguish if there is this shareness or not. And I was very happy to read this paper, Carpenter and Liebel. So basically, again, very, very same construction as the muscle. But the aim of the paper was to provide some operationalized account of shared intentionality or of joint attention. And so they transformed this definition, <coughs> or Thomas's account rather, because Mimi said that it's different. So they transformed Thomas's account to two parts. There must be motivation to share attention on both parts, and second, the participants know together that they are sharing attention. And how to recognize this knowing together? They said the most natural way is to look for communication uh, link. There must be some communication going on within the subject. So, this would be some uh, like if you don't see any kind of communication, it can always be something like this, like unending reiteration, like thinking to the other, but maybe it's just they are somehow embedded in, in their unique bubbles. And this is, I think, what is really crucial, crucial for the empirical part of the debate that we must look for operationalized criteria. And uh, I published a paper which was uh, using this Carpenter and Cal approach, but uh, it was transformed into a different words. So first, both interest in real sites of interest in an object is basically the same. And uh, here it's clearly stated they must communicate with each other with some respect to the object. Now we can play with the word. I wouldn't like to say that they must communicate about the object. Because once you say this, probably most of us <coughs> will uh, already regard this in respect to some linguistic activities and so on. <coughs> So, once again, knowing together is exemplified by communication, which is good because it is detectable condition. We have many tools, like if we properly understood what's going on in a specific species, we can say if they are communicating together or not. And uh, what is co 
consequence of this uh, reformulation. I think that we <coughs> really first need to uh, think of communication before this uh, kinds of uh, simple kinds of social cognition like your attention and so on. I think this is uh, this is in good accord to uh, Bernard's paper. I am not now sure where it was published, 2013. So both phylogenetically and like communication should precede this cognitive uh, states or cognitive or events like joint attention and so on. So now I will I hope it will work. I will show you one video with gorillas. This one. Yeah. So, okay, back into presentation. Like, my idea is that uh, this is one of the examples which actually uh, perfectly match both the cases one, one, and two. So you can see strong interest in the object, also strong inter-affective uh, inter engagement between both individuals, and they use cases, some gestures, vocalization behind the inheritance here to keep partner engaged in the game. So, as far as uh, triadic games are considered, and uh, we use this definition of joint attention, it seems that Gorillas and other names would, uh, would go through. Now there is in the third level, and uh, it's probably so. Let's let's go from this zoom to laboratories. And what is interesting that the laboratory, uh, it seems that there are there are some kinds of experiments not so different from one laboratory to another. But the results are very different. So it doesn't seem to be only about definitions, but really about abilities of individual enemies. So uh, now, Tomasov's approach once again says that joint attention requires altruistic motivation. So here is altruism and uh, our cooperativeness and joint attention somehow matched into this definition and concept of joint attention. But Evans and Bart say that joint attention and cooperativeness have different developmental trajectories. Now, they make experiments with three groups. They were young children, chimpanzees with standard care and chimpanzees with responsive care. So it means that there was a lot of interaction with other chimps and also with human keepers. And 
Now there are two graphs about this development of trajectories. This is joint attention. This is cooperativeness. And black is human case, red is responsive care, and blue is standard care. So their claim is that in joint attention after nine months, really there is something going on differently with, with human children. But with cooperativeness, not at all. Like these responsive care chips even surpassed uh, kids in, in, in the world. So, now we can say that skills of chimpanzees and children might differ, but it still doesn't mean that there is something quite significant. And uh, I also, I will now discuss this with Linda that I think actually that what we need is some <laughs> like a big different philosophy of how to talk about uh, not only uh, human world but also about uh, animal world and there is one tradition connected mainly with German speaking countries which talk about Umwelt and this will be the last part of my presentation. So, this is some reconstruction of the dispute. So, first we have seen selective scholarship, like, so now, what, what is interesting for me, like, what everything is involved in the so vastly differing results of this, of this behavior, uh, behavior. So, uh, the first was selective scholarship towards this chimpanzee scale kind of point. The second one, I believe that it's double in interpretation of basically same behavior data. So, uh, what Thomas would claim that human does not gorilla training case involves joint attention. But in fact, the whole dispute is about the definition and form of joint attention. It's not so much into into the uh, empirical event as such. And the last part was that different behavior data do not necessarily account for the difference in species specific abilities. So it might be that the result is that uh, children, but not chimpanzees, are able to pass some tests. But it doesn't mean that there is any cognitive gap, it can just be about this problem that there are different abilities of individual animals. And if we want to have right picture of what's going on, we need to think of the specific ecological space or we need to think of laboratory specific ecological space when this story is developed. So now I will I will try to point out some problems in this comparative laboratory approach. Usually only experimental, like because there are these many opposing views, but usually the critique concerns only experimental design. But from like ethologist field, the main accusation of non-relevance of some of these uh, results would come from the fact that uh, experiments are quite often straight of chimpanzee social reality. Uh, for example, the quality of group relations really differs throughout the time, and if, chim if there is a chimpanzee novel to the group novel to the situation, it will probably not be very cooperative with others. It will be scared. So, what is probably even more important from a logical point of view that if you compare uh, children and chimpanzees with some tasks that are 
let's say, uh, more close to social reality of our world. So children use ornament, it's, it's more connected with the uh, experimenter as a person. So, uh, experimenter is quite often editing some cues, the latest cues don't necessarily need to be linguistic. And children are much better in, in uh, understanding and uh, understanding the skills that chimpanzees in biosemantic literature and art, and also like animal cognition and of course, like generally this is known as whatever child phenomenon. Uh, this picture isn't very good, but believe me that the interlocutor is against is uh, behind Plexi's last panel and uh, so the problem behind the experiments also can be that children are usually uh, investigated in the area which is quite nice because otherwise their parents wouldn't uh, let the experiment go but chimpanzees are quite often investigated under some cage bars and so on. So again, the ecological setting is different. I think I will highlight only a few points here. Like this will be something what will constitute this, let's say, global model for chimpanzee social condition. Another criteria we need to, or variables we need to take into account is life history of individual animals. Also, heterogeneity of individual abilities and motivations. And this part might be more interesting for some of you. I will claim that the whole ontological commitments and research goals really may influence on the result of the laboratory. So this is something which goes against, I don't know, mainstream naturalistic belief that uh, we can, all the disputes can be settled by empirical findings and so on. And the main issue here is this continuity versus this continuity debate which was also introduced in also. So, for comprehensive model, there are several areas which account for the results of actions of individual animals. Like, I think what is, uh, what is strong part of Bart and Levens is that actually their model seems to be grounded in <coughs> contemporary evolutionary development, I don't know, paradigm in evolutionary ecology, which also take epigenetics into account and uh, says that laboratory habitat is very specific ecology, quite different from what's going on in uh, their natural habitats in Africa. And so uh, sorry, it's, it's, it's ontological commitments of the experiment, not of the animal, right? Yes. Because it looks like it influences the actions. Why is that funny? I think they do have ontological commitments. Because they assume that something exists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I, will, I will be more precise in a minute what I call ontological commitments. But Basically, it, it's uh, really some philosophy behind uh, if they want, to, they want to show if there is this human uniqueness or if there is rather continuity and so on. So I think what is really crucial in regard to this uh, ecology problem that the chimpanzees live in very different con conditions and their performances 
should be distinguished if it's in wilderness, biomedical laboratories, sanctuaries, or if chimpanzees are homeless. And this is again something from biosemiotics that sign processes or the way how they communicate is very different because there is influence of, of uh, other interests and synthesis ecological niche, niches. So, this is, I think, quite understandable for philosophers. It's something which some people like multi constructivist approach. So, it's not only we who construct what's going on in case of animal cognition, but also chimpanzees interpret what's going on in the laboratory. So it's somehow like double process of interpretation which makes it always quite difficult and we need to really take into account that all animals are autonomous agents with their way of interpreting what's going on, even in, in experiment like some animals do have understanding, some have another understanding. And uh, these ontological commitments of researchers actually influence their performance because uh, there is some laboratory setting and uh, the whole constitution of ecological space is somehow linked to the ontological commitment. So basically, and this is why it's called threefold models, because I think we need to take all the levels into account and the reconstruction of the whole story with any single laboratory would be probably involving all of this region. And I think there are mutual influences. So this is what I added to the presentation just uh, one hour ago because I really like to adjust the differentiation and I actually just submitted this Timo Marman article which is going according to very same lines. So, this is about ontological commitments. There are basically four different ways how to how to speak about evolution in terms of humans and animals. Darwin, it's gradualism, he says uh, humans are on the highest position on, on this evolutionary tree and there is continuity. Franz de Waal now is quite famous for saying that humans are, let's say, equal in their cognitive abilities to other animals or that the cognition of every species is different to such an extent that we cannot claim that we are superior to others. Now, Tomasello for me is an example of transformativism, transformativism because he says there is discontinuity. And joint attention is what makes this discontinuity our ability to do. And there is the force. Uh, possibility and most of biosemiotician will probably like this notion of pluralism and they say there is discontinuity between humans and animals but there is also discontinuity between chimpanzees and cats and this discontinuity might be really vast in comparison to this companies between chimpanzees and humans. And I think this is the crucial moment. Like most of uh, evolutionary biologists would probably like this as a starting ground for discussion of such, of such problems. But uh, I, will, I will show that things are more complicated at the end. I have no support on page start, is it one fifty? So yeah, I'll finish by two fifteen and you'll be okay. Okay. Yeah, soon.
So, I want to make just a few examples how these ontological commitments can influence interpretation of some empirical events. So, Peter Hobson, developmental psychologist in his book, Credit also uh, mentioned how Michael Tomasello introduced him to his chimpanzees. And I will read just a part of me. As psychologists, I have been taught to analyze the counter transference, which means that I try to formulate how this individual is making me feel. He's talking about chimpanzee behind uh, the uh, fence. So I sat there and tried my very hardest to do just that. I felt something missing. I couldn't connect. And afterwards, he's making this comparison with autistic children. And uh, like this lack of, uh, let's say, common ground. <coughs> At the end, he speculates that probably it's not only because the chimpanzees are different species, but that this strange uh, disconnection of the minds is just also among chimpanzees themselves. So there is an empirical situation. Hobson uh, tried to communicate with chimpanzees, but uh, all okay. And this is this is now the issue. From my interpretation, would be totally different. He just didn't do the right steps to connect with the chimpanzee because he, uh, he didn't use his hands, his legs, he just sat there so the chimpanzee didn't have any other motivation also only to sit there. And it's the problem of interspecific communication, either you are able to to do some uh, transference of meanings with the animals or not, and this is not the way how you should do that. So, double interpretation. For, for Hobson, this continuity thesis for me, uh, probably he doesn't know how to interact with the chimpanzee. Uh, this is quite an interesting case, I believe. So, Rivens and his colleagues, they are not doing only empirical work, but they want to attack uh, this, let's say, ontology of cognitivism exemplified by Thomas Sellow as such. And in an article which they published just one year ago about mismeasure of ape social cognition, they say that actually all accounts which have the background philosophical commitments to invisible mental states which cause over behaviors is false. Because they do not believe that we can properly infer the existence of uh, mental states from respective behaviors. So, this is something like general model of what's going on in this uh, Cognitivist approach with causal mental states. So, first uh, assumption epistemic states exist prior to choice behavior. Second assumption epistemic states are not uniquely specified in choice behavior. Third epistemic states cause choice behavior, and fourth, it is impossible to directly measure mental states. So I think I think that basically Thomas was a kind of also I don't know maybe in discussion you will tell me that there is something missing or something additional but basically I think it's okay and let's look uh, at at their argument. If one believes that certain mental states will cause organism to point declaratively, as an example of this, of this causal mental state. 
They display all the decorative point cannot be legitimately taken to be evidence for the alleged causal mental state. So, like, the logical framework here is modus ponens. So, they say there is this causal mental state which should be made, made visible by this pointing behavior. But, uh, the argument from laboratory experiments is false because if they see pointing behavior, they go from the consequence to, to the premise. So they say there is causal mental state. And uh, like in their attempt to somehow ridicule this this uh, framework, they say, okay, so let's uh, replace certain mental states with some imaginary cause like demonic agent. And if you follow the same logic as, as uh, Thomas Zello and all of this using causal mental states, you could make uh, the you could make the argument that there is demonic agent causing this literary pointing. Like the argument could go all the way through. So, I made some first attempts to show how this multi constructivism model could look like also including ontological commitments and I want to uh, compare it with something which I call laboratory optimism. So this column is laboratory optimism, this is multi-constructivism. Mental states are detectable by performances in experimental design. But uh, Okay, this is this is very much influenced also with an activism and basically with uh, you can say some phenomenological tradition, and so on. But I think it's important for this operation operationalized uh, procedure procedure how to be more sure of going on. So especially in interspecies comparison. The only way how to know something about mental state is, is to look at overt behaviors. Like, I mean, there is, it's always a problem to make division about, about mental states in case of animals and their overt behaviors. Uh, actions of individual animals are classified according to definitions instead of operationalized criteria. Uh, yes, so this is about the problem of definitions. Every time they involve mental states, there is potential raised for this double interpretation of humans and animal skin. And uh, the third part is once again about this ontological level. So, in laboratory optimism, like based on all of these empirical experiments, laboratory experiments, at the end you should be able to infer some evolutionary history. But I think it's precisely the opposite. Like, what's going on? That first you have strong ontological commitment either to continuity or discontinuity. And then the results of laboratory experiments are passed into language which is from the beginning through these other dimensions somehow uh, instantiated by this view. So we are dealing at the end of the presentation. And now I will try to say just a few words about this Humboldt theory. I don't know if you have, you have ever 
read something about this. I think it's important because uh, it's trying to say that uh, basically every hive animal is able to model the world around, is able to interpret what's going on, is making sense of also uh, their social world or how we, how, we, how we call it. So one definition of Umwelt can be that it's model of a species specific segment of individual reality. So once again, our Umwelt is quite different from chimpanzee Umwelt, <coughs> it's different from cat Umwelt. Every species has its uh, specific Umwelt and like the point of view, like how to imagine it is that it's something like life work of an, of an animal. So every individual animal has a life work, but this movement is usually meant as a model of this segment of life work with the species specific. So what is crucial that within every movement there is specific form of communication. So the question of pointing, like we shouldn't first ask if they are able to point, but we need to understand the beginning how they communicate. And according to their way of communicating, we should make the experiments more chimpanzee friendly, for example. Uh, oops. So now consider this problem with joint attention or you should do the generalist driven engagement. Well, they are different to humans because it's just these presuppositions of the theory that there are differences between all of the species, but uh, there are also some some similarities similarities because they are social species and there is an evol evolutionary connection. But how to understand the communication? It's important to know that they don't have something like social smiles, declarative pointing, they can learn it from people, but it's not natural to them. There is probably no direct teaching. So, uh, we need to understand the way of how they communicate in their natural settings. Uh, at the same time, you know, we need to know that they are able to learn from humans and it's not only about pointing, but it's also about some basics of sign language, for example. So, uh, for example, if a laboratory researcher would, would, would think that something like shared look is a marker of joint uh, attention, it would be really mischievous because for chimpanzees it's basically threat. And in, in some, in some uh, social situation among humans it's actually very simple. So, this is this is uh, illustration what's involved. One more uh, important word: enculturation. So, okay, there are these strong differences, but what's going on in laboratory environments? It's that. Uh, some chimpanzees, and now consider this distinction between standard care and some other uh, cares, there is uh, not only that uh, chimpanzees can make uh, what people are doing, like cognitive prosthesis, but also some of the, uh, let's say that not, not only researchers, but also keepers. If they are sensitive to this difference in movements, they, are, they can be <laughs> somehow chimpanized, if I might say this. So 
they will probably also be attentive to their way of communicating and uh, we can talk about mixed communities. So, actually what is at stake in this laboratory experiment? That we need to talk about these hybrid communities that humans and animals engage in what can be called reciprocal hermeneutics around one another's action and effects. And uh, because I thought that communication is probably really something which is need further research. So first what should be done is uh, investigation into specific communication in hybrid communities. Serone uh, made wrote a very nice article about so-called pidgin language, which is this uh, intermediate intermediate ways of communication in, in these uh, communities. It can be also compared to private language known as I think Finnish time and other philosophers. And uh, so it is about this interspecific co cohabitation and now I can directly to conclusions so uh, What is, what is crucial in these disputes? So first, really, we should, we should be sensitive to the background story. If it's about evolutionary continuity or if the main uh, aim is to fight anthropological differences. Now, I think that if uh, researchers and philosophers and all other people involved in this debate would be more sensitive to these big stories. They should be able to somehow navigate between this skill and character of sameness and difference, let's say. And I actually think this, this Moodle term is very good for this because I put from the very beginning, the difference between all the species is accounted for here. But, of course, there is the big evolutionary story behind. So, uh, like, uh, you, can, you can also say that there is some basic kind of continuity because we are living on the same planet and like we have descended from the shared ancestors and so on. So it's always like both parts should be one should be should be somehow involved in the in the story and this dialectics is probably never ending. So like informed by this uh, by this situation, we can truly say that animals cannot reach the height specific for human social cognitive and linguistic domain. But on the other hand, chimpanzees can create and follow joint intentions appropriate for their own well. So <coughs> they are a bit different to our joint intentions, but on the other hand, like if there are some empirical events like collective hunting it's really different it's sorry it's really problematic to make evolutionary narrative which uses uh, collective hunting of our uh, preceders in, in stone age as the as the crucial as the crucial event which made us different from our animal or animal-like ancestors. So we, should, we should be really sensitive to 
what is what is known from here. And uh, the last part it's also showing that these uh, differences by movement are not there uh, without some possibilities to transgress them. And uh, as an example, I would mention this ability of some uncultured chimpanzees to use basics of sign languages and they are able to understand human created conventions and so on. Thank you for your attention. For example, but generally, if we want to 
make it possible for another animals which have different ways of communicating. I think that we should make something more general. And this motivation to share attention, like joyful motivation or something like that, if we want to make it uh, operationalized, it should be these signs of interest. Okay. So there is there is no cooperation in the way Thomas Hall wants to see. But on the other hand, like with every triadic game, we must think that they are following some habits or rules. They are not fighting. <laughs> so like uh, this kind of contests are always embedded into something which can be also cast in you know non non agonistic view. Like it's not it's not it's not pure cooperation, but uh, it's also not fight. <laughs> so there there mm -hmm. for example like and this is once again like this signs of interest or joy. So if it's joyful situation it 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 means that they are sharing the game, they are sharing the space of the game. It's called the competition in a cooperative context, so like always from we, you know, yeah. sports. So or, it's yeah. co competition, but which is not egoistic. Good luck. Yeah, it's, it's a very rich presentation, a lot of highlights. And just the thing about um, chips pointing with the lips, I think you could. You from it, you know, there's this big debate on pointing behavior, and now somebody tells you they are doing it but with their lips, and that's, I find this very exciting. But of course, the question is how do they point? Do they point altruistically and declare the intention, or do they just want the banana in which they can reach, reach themselves? Now, the, so is the take home message this? So, some people say it's, it's more or less the same in our relatives, but to a uh, maybe to a lesser degree, and others say there is this discontinuity, like Tomasello, we, we are, our form of intelligence is different from those of our relatives, and you want to say, uh, the, yes. you want to have a dialectical approach, and you want to say, well, first of all, we have to consider the environment, so the ecological thing, but then I just can't see why you should get rid of the question whether it's the same or not just by focusing on their own way no. of living in an environment. To me, it doesn't seem to solve to answer the question. It's still, well, either it's the same or not, maybe in a different environment, but the same in a different environment or not the same in a different environment. So there I don't understand. And concerning the, the gorillas, I'm all Thomasellian about this, the film you showed. I couldn't see one moment in that episode where the two were jointly attending to the ball. Not one moment. So first, the, the big one had the ball and the other one was following, obviously trying to get at the ball. Because it was the ball that interested the little one. Then sort of the, the big one lost interest. And the little one had the ball and climbed up the stone. There was one moment where I thought, well, now the joint attention has to start because it was bumping the ball a little bit. And I thought it meant to attract the other's attention. But obviously not, because all it was trying to do was to sort of test its properties to climb on top of it. And then the other one came back and, and took the ball and went to the lawn. And the little one sort of jumped on the big one, and they totally lost interest in the ball, but were, you know, uh, struggling, or, you know, playing with each other a little bit. So, and no one, you know, what I would have needed here was an episode like this. You know, one is throwing the ball to the other, and the other is throwing it back. So, you know, playing with the ball. But I just couldn't see how this illustrates in any meaningful sense joint attention, what, whatever conception you have. Yeah, but, uh, uh, Okay, I, 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 of course, I perfectly follow what you mean, but like, okay, I don't have, I don't have children myself, so I don't, I don't have much, much, much empirical experience with them. But I would assume, like, if there is game of children, I don't know, nine months old, like they are also very easily disrupted by what's going on elsewhere. 
and sometimes they are more interested. But in you have that. these moments where you know one is showing the thing to the other to attract the other's attention to it. I, I now have it, and I thought that was going on when, when one on the rock sort of bumped the ball. I thought he was doing that. Obviously not, because the other individual was totally inattentive. And it was just, you know, testing the ball for itself. I, 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 I climbed on top of it. So, I, 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 no, there was not a, a second, you know. I, I don't know about kids either. To my knowledge, I have no kids. So, uh, I, I don't know what exactly is going on there. But I but imagine I, that there's got to be this moment of genuine sharing of attention. But, uh, but I assume that uh, your notion of genuine sharing is the uh, same as myself. But I really have in mind this more, I would say, original account of uh, joint attention, like where, with, if you try to operationalize it, you would end up with something like this. And uh, in my, from my point of view, like there are moments, I don't say the whole time, but there are moments when they really share the interest because they communicate with each other and like because it depends on your concept of communication. If we're communicating if I want the candy well, and you want it and we bump into each other, if that's communication then by all means. Yeah. Well communication is is uh, that uh, they they interact with some gestures. They they, uh, it doesn't have to be anything special, you know. For example, and now of course there, once again, there is continuity. So, so an activist would say that in this example of contest over the ball, there is also communication because with one player, like, yeah, can you show the, the gesture in the video? Where, at what, what point was there a gesture? an act of communication between the two that was I mean it's got to be related to the ball right yeah well uh, we can try to do that but much more much better example for this uh, like communication would be would be really uh, something different so these experiments with sign language they are re really able to like without mistake to join signs with some actions or, or with, with, with some objects. So like if you if you believe that there is like sensible uh, change uh, in interchange between them, so there okay. must be sure attention. Well, there was a job that you yes, because that. I just, my question is exactly on the same topic as Margaret and Hans Brenner. But I guess my suggestion is a bit this, on the opposite. Um, so, I, what I don't understand is how can we make sense of what was going on with the Morillas without the idea of them being involved in shared activity. So, my, I think that what well, it's clear from the example is that they are involved in an interaction and it's a shared activity. And, uh, and then there the, might be a question about what kind of shared activity they're involved in. But I think this is uh, even, so I think it's not, um, yeah, and maybe this is something which we should also say about communication. Uh, so, I, I, so what I was puzzled about is this claim that um, joint attention and cooperation, again, again, this goes back to how one understands what cooperation is. If cooperation is Communicative intentions of the Christian kind, and I've seen the Thomasella picture, and no. But if cooperation is social cooperation in the sense that they are the knowledge and activities, but I think that is uh, required for understanding joint attention. So, yeah. No, so, okay. <laughs> so, that goal. Uh, right, I, so, uh, so, so my worry was that what's so left so. out in this analysis is joint. Uh, joint action, shared activity of some kind. Yes. Shared, shared activity. They are yes. playing a game. Yes. This is something they are doing together. They, they, they might not be, you know, just yeah. throwing the ball to one another, but they are playing together this game. 
which is as, when, when the interaction continues, at the, at the very end it's just undeniable. But in, and so my my so I think that I, I agree with that of what they were saying in this sense. There are many ways in which one can um, define the concept of short attention or the concept of cooperation, the concept of communication. But the one thing I was thinking that uh, that is required to make sense of a short attention is this idea of there being some kind of shared activity. And then, yeah, so that is my suggestion. I think it goes a bit against okay. what the council said. Uh, but I don't think that it's should have in that case. Okay, so... Okay, no. Okay. I agree with you. Right? So, so you are suggesting actually the move from this, uh, from this uh, cognitive approach uh, to its inner mental states no. to activities as over um, behavior. Well, I was thinking, yeah, no, I'm not suggesting that the cognitive is right. I'm suggesting that